The prime goal of government is to protect the minority of the opulent from the majority. And in order to do that, you've got to fragment the majority so they really can't get together and do very much. And you have to concentrate power in the wealth of the nation. Michael Malice here. Let that be your welcome for the next hour. I am ecstatic for our guest today, David Petrezza, uh, who has been one of my favorite guests. You've been on before, and you're welcome when it was on Compound Media. Your new book is called TR's Last War by Teddy Roosevelt. I have read it. It is excellent. And in fact, I'll tell you a little funny story about it. I got the book in the mail, and I look at the back cover. I'm like, oh, what they write about here? And it turns out I blurbed it. It's there's my name, and it says an amazing political historian, Michael Miles. And I'm, at first, I was annoyed. I'm like, <laughs> they didn't ask me about this. And then I was really annoyed because I'm like, I would have given them such a better blurb because I can talk. You are you are such a good author, and here's why I think everyone should pick up your book. I've read and and your other books too, which I adore. You've also written 1920, the year of six presidents, which was about Wilson and Teddy Roosevelt and Calvin Coolidge and, and Warren Harding. You've written about uh, the 1960 race, about Nixon versus LBJ versus JFK, which which is my least favorite because I hate all three of them. <laughs> I don't find them interesting at all. Uh, and also 1948, about the legendary campaign between uh, Thomas Dewey, who was a given to win uh and harry truman which is probably the biggest upset since trump until trump hillary yes. i mean probably yeah. unquestionably uh and what you are so good at as a historian is you really humanize these people we have this idea that especially nowadays you know that oh trump is unprecedented and that he's going around insulting all these people back then they didn't have emails they didn't they didn't really use the phone they're writing letters truman was pretty rough yeah, and, and but a lot of these guys, they're just na yeah. saying the nastiest things, and it's hilarious, especially the thread in this book of how much Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson despised each other on a personal level. So reading about this, I don't even know if I want to say feud, but feud's probably a certain good word for it. It's just hilarious how these are just two titans of history, but they're also very small men in their own way. Yeah, they've, they've known each other for a long time because they, they start in this progressive movement in the 1890s. They're intellectuals. They meet in, I think, Baltimore at a speech. And what, what amazed me was that when TR becomes president, he's sworn in after McKinley's assassination. One of the first people he, he sees is Woodrow Wilson, who is just passing through town on the way back from a vacation in Canada. And I think Wilson sours on TR first. He's very suspicious of where this guy is coming from, and he's probably a little too boisterous for his taste. And then when he starts pricking at TR in the press, then TR draws back. And of course, when they're running against each other in 1912, TR is is concentrating more on his hatred of William Howard Taft. Yeah. So he doesn't notice how much he hates Woodrow Wilson, but he's certainly going to be a quick learner in that regard. And what really gets him off the dime on that is Panama. And the uh, that Wilson wants to kiss and make up with Colombia, have a treaty which is essentially to apologize for what the United States did, what TR did. And this just sets Roosevelt off totally. And part, you know, part of that is that Wilson is breaking some of his uh, campaign promises, the 1912 Democratic platform, which says Americans are going to, you know, go through that toll lane for free. And Wilson kind of caves into Great Britain to get Britain, it, you know, history is so complex yeah. to get Britain uh, in the United States side in what the big mess, which is going on in Mexico. If you think the Mexican border is a mess now, right. well, at least we don't have Pancho Villa raiding Columbus, New Mexico, or Pershing going south with Patton, George S. Patton, bringing back uh, Villa's second in command on the hood of a car, dead. 
What I didn't realize, you know, because we always, Roosevelt's on Mount Rushmore, right? So, but we're taught somewhat little about him. Uh, we're taught he's a trust buster. He was probably the first, you know, progressive president, you know, and, and, and to the McKinley era was kind of the last of a certain kind of, of breed. But after he divided the Republican Party in 1912, he in some ways was the original rhino. Like he was loathed by members of his own party. Well, yeah, and he's gone really leftward in terms of progressivism. Of course, you know, in, in all of my books, you, you pretty much see, particularly the further back you go, yeah, you see that the left-right continuum, the Democrat-Republican continuum doesn't hold so that the Democrats may be anti-suffrage back then. You know, the Democrats, you know, not to sound like some Dinesh D'Souza movie, but in terms of race, the Democrats are the ones with all the segregation oh, and, and the Wilson lynching the, and all that. was the quintessential yeah. example of this. Yeah, Birth of a Nation, Woodrow Wilson, yeah. So it's, it's it, he is, the as president, he is progressive. But then as ex-president, then he really ramps it up. And in 1910, he gives this speech and, uh, Potawatomi, Kansas, where John Brown came from, which is the, the new nationalism and is, is very extremely radical. And from there you get the 1912 progressive platform. So yeah, it's not Republican. And as late as October, 1918, you know, he's saying publicly, I want the Republican party. If it's the Republican party is going to be just the same old Republican party and not progressive and not radical. I think he uses the word radical. Uh, I don't want any part of it. Yeah. Okay. You're going to, you're going to, if you eliminate me, you know, it's going to be on my terms. I read uh, just recently last month, a book by one of Roosevelt's kind of uh, gurus, Herbert David Crowley, I think that's yeah. his name, uh, called the promise of American life. And it is a blueprint flat out for an American fascism before the term existed. Just this. Have you read it? No. Oh, it's it, the evil emanates. It's like the Necronomicon. The, I mean, he basically lays out that like what, what would become TR's new nationalism, the idea that like every American citizen has to work on behalf of the state and the country. That's one of the things that TR says in that yeah. 1910 speech. That, you know, you people can keep their wealth if it is, you know, directed towards the, the collective or the greater good. And uh, there's a quote at the beginning of a book called... Uh, Bully Boy, very polemical book against uh, TR, but you know, it, it, some valuable stuff in it. And there's a, the quote begins with, you know, I don't think it's such a bad thing to have all power uh, concentrated in one man. Hello. Yeah, no, and, and also TR's point, ignoring completely the 10th Amendment, where he says, well, if the Constitution doesn't explicitly forbid me from doing something, it effectively permits it. Well, the 10th Amendment says the exact opposite. He just basically ignored it, and most presidents have ignored well, it. Well, that, that says the, the Congress, but he's, like, taking it on to himself, sure. where if, if they say I can't uh, do it, okay, but if otherwise, I'm going to do anything I want to do. This is the guy who says... I took uh, Panama and let the Congress debate. Right, 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 right. Um, and, and one of the okay. one of the favorite little incidents in that book, which just you know comes by because it's really before the book starts, but you have to have a background as to who this guy is. Is in 1908 he's leaving office, and Joseph Pulitzer, who is old and blind, uh, his New York World and the Indianapolis News, another newspaper, have printed reports that maybe some money from the um, American uh, payoff to the canal company uh, uh, went to TR's brother-in-law and uh, Taft's half-brother. And TR instructs uh, Henry Stimson, very famous guy, gonna be Secretary of War, even under Franklin Roosevelt, a real establishment guy, deep state sort of guy. Sure. Um, to bring criminal, criminal libel charges for criminally libeling not a person, but the United States government. If this thing goes through, you know, freedom of the press in America is really on the skids, and, and, and thankfully it, it doesn't. It gets tossed out of court on a technicality, actually, but, but then it's, like, it's over. And that, like, harkens back to the Sedition Acts from, you know, the it really administration, is. which it was, like, one, regarded as, like, one of the most abominable laws that ever been yeah. passed in America. 
Um, and, so, and that's, you know, that's before the hysteria of 1917, 1918. Yeah, where Woodrow Wilson was, you know, it's funny when people talk about in contemporary times, as a historian, you must roll your eyes on a daily basis, if not every five minutes, when people are like, oh, these attacks on the press are unprecedented. And you look at, you know, Wilson and, and Lincoln and some of these other people, and it's just like, what are you talking, or even Obama, you know, like, what are you talking about? Like, historically, there has been always a very antagonistic relationship between the executive branch and the press. I think they're supposed to be. Yeah, That's right. That's the yeah. idea. Yeah. They're supposed to keep each other honest to some extent. So let me, let's, uh, you, I, I, I can't, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned this because I hadn't thought to do it myself. You just made an aside to Dinesh D'Souza, D'Souza, excuse me, as someone who's a, in my view, a very reputable historian, what do you think of his work? I've, I've seen bits of it and, you know, it looks again, too polemical and right. in some cases not particularly, you know, accurate, you know, so, but I, I'm not an expert on it, but I kind of st- I'm not about the troop to the theater. Well, it's just, it's, for me, it's very bizarre for him to equate like the Klan and the Nazis and the Democrats of today and say these things are, are all phenomenal, uh, syn- synonymous, given that FDR, you know, fought the Nazis and given that many Southern racists went overseas to fight the Nazis yeah, as well. Well, you know, well, you know, gang, the largest membership of the Klan in the 20s was in Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois. Wow. Okay, in the north, and and they controlled the Republican Party in Indiana. That was a big deal, and and there there were Northerners. There were uh, in Maine. Uh, Owen Brewster was backed by the Klan, a Republican. So you know, it's the it it again. It doesn't go all one way. Yeah, we and, have and, to... and the Klan is uh, you know it's a national organization back then. It's not those crazy guys in the sixties bombing school children right. it's 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 much broader base hey guys michael malice here I want to talk to you about infinite cbd it offers the cleanest healthiest and purest form of cbd that's available and what is cbd well it's 100 legal so don't worry about that it's a natural ingredient taken from hemp plants that helps keep your body's endocannabinoid system balanced cbd cannabinoid basically it gives you all the benefits of marijuana without getting high and research shows that cbd has helped people with chronic pain inflammation with anxiety and they got a bunch of products that you can try to enjoy CBD the way you prefer. They've got capsules, they've got vape juice, they've got gummies. Here's a few ways you can use them. Gummies, right? You take the gummies, calms you down. If you've got insomnia, helps you fall asleep. If you're stressed, calms you down. Then you have the CBD pills with caffeine, CBD AM, and that's great for you need to focus, to be calm, and to get stuff done. And they even have a topical cream. So if you're sore, you know what I mean? Or like pain after the gym or something like that, you put it on, stuff that hurts, and it won't hurt anymore. If you go to their website, infinitecbd.com, and use Welcome15, you get 15% off. So infinitecbd.com, Welcome15. Yeah, this idea that like it... uh you know, we have obviously America has a very racist history, but the idea that this would be localized to one of the parties is absolutely does not make sense. Just even if you think about it for five seconds. No, no. So let me let me talk to you about some of the choice little quotes from this book because it's so fun reading all these little asides you found, and I I'm imagining you like I did when I was doing research for my North Korea book. You find a little little bone mo or like someone having a jab, and you're just sitting there, must be chortling to yes. yourself. And I'm just imagine it's during the 1912. Um, uh, Republican uh, uh, presidential uh, Republican convention, right? Is Taft going to be renominated? Is Teddy Roosevelt going to bolt? Is Teddy Roosevelt going to capture the nomination? And William Jennings Bryan, you know, perennial Democratic leader, just sits there and jokes. If you didn't know where you were, you might think you were in a Democratic convention. That's right. I mean, that's just absolutely. <laughs> well, they were ringing the. Uh podium with barbed wire because they thought the progressives were going to charge the podium i mean it it was absolutely wild and tr tr pulls a number out of a hat you know if you think about joe mccarthy with 205 communists or 57 he pulls a number out of a hat as to how many delegates are really contested and of course the system of delegates was something he had helped craft to get Taft nominated in 1908 right. but all of a sudden now oh the horrors of this <laughs> right so, you built this Frankenstein's you, monster you built it yeah and, and then he is so again and then he is so ticked off because well you know in the Republican Party they had black delegates to the conventions the Democrats did not I mean like zero but the Republicans had them but they represented essentially rotten boroughs from the south right so they didn't represent what do you any mean by votes. Rotten boroughs? 
uh, a rotten borough was something in British parliamentary system where almost nobody lived in them, no or no one voted in them. So you represented almost no one. So a delegate, a Republican delegate from the South would represent almost nobody. Got it. And they would be they would be there to give convention uh, votes for the nominee and uh, in return to get like postmasterships and stuff like patronage. So the black delegates from the South, because they're all like postmasters or something, are supporting Taft. And this seriously ticks off Roosevelt. And he rules that when the progressives meet in a few weeks, there are going to be no black progressive delegates from the South. Right. And his, and even nowadays, the idea that progressivism is synonymous with black rights, when back then that was absolutely not the case well, at all. Well, certainly when they say no blacks need apply to right. be delegates. Yeah, it's like nobody. <laughs> so here's another quote that I love because a lot of times, you know, uh, this is 100 years ago. So the language sometimes might sound a little archaic. But what's hilarious... I love archaic right, language. So do I, but it's even funnier when it, the case is it's not that it's actually archaic. It's that it was archaic even by the language of the terms because Teddy Roosevelt's giving a, a, a just passing by some veterans, right? And he goes, it does me a lot of good to see some real men when molly coddles seem to be so much to the fore. The only human being that I think as little of as I do of a molly coddle is a crook. To my mind, there is no one so degraded as a crook. And a molly coddle is little better than a crook. But then he's asked, what's a molly coddle? <laughs> and he goes, nothing but a grown up sissy. But it's hilarious that even back then they're like, what are you talking about? What is this word? <laughs> well, actually, there, there was a, a famous Douglas Fairbanks senior movie called The Molly Coddle. So I'm not quite sure. I think they were just trying to uh, trip him up or something. Oh. Okay. But no, it was, it was, that was a big hit uh, around, around that time or even a couple of years later. Yeah. So in your opinion, why? But was, I, I, like I, the, I like the use of his word Trump. Well, you, you, you know, two or three times in the book, I quote him as calling someone a Trump. Right. But yeah. that's a good thing. It's a good thing. Yeah, a, Trump a Trump is a card. good thing. Yeah, yes. it's a top card. Yeah. Why do you think, do you think Roosevelt deserves to be on, after reading this book, he comes off, first of all, no one denied that at all, that he was a, a egomaniac. I mean, the force of his personality was, pro he might have had the biggest personality of any president oh, yeah. uh, other than Trump, maybe. Of any American. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was, it was insane. It, I mean, he was almost a character. He does everything. Yeah. But at the same time, he also comes off as, in some ways, like a crazy person, which I guess goes hand in hand. Well, they were looking, <laughs> the, the New York Times in, I think, 1912 got some big psychologist who was, I think, a descendant of Alexander Hamilton oh. <laughs> to, to like, you know, you know, when you get a personality like this, they're kind of wacky. And, they, you know, it's like, you know, you know, I'm not saying anyone specifically, but it was obvious they were talking about about TR being uh, crazy. And as I think it's Henry Adams, you know, there were these rumors that he was an alcoholic or, or hopped up on drugs or something because he's, you know, like, you know, the Robin Williams of presidents, okay? <laughs> and, and so uh, Henry Adams, who knew him said, and did not didn't particularly admire him, says, uh, you know, he, he was drunk only on himself. You just made a reference to something that you talk about at the very end of your book, which is oh, a little yes, bit Oh, yes, I did. I've done that twice, and then I think about it, yes. So uh, they actually sent out a press release. Yes, uh, which was wrong. Which was wrong. Yes, yeah, about I appreciate it. Yeah, I was like, this. I, I read the book. So you have a theory, a pet theory. Um, and it's it, I, I, it, it, if, if this was anybody else, the way it was phrased, it looks like a, a quack, but it's not. You're just speculating based on yes. the power of his personality. Tell, tell us about that, what you're speculating. What, it, what, it, what happened was, uh, you know, there are a lot of footnotes in this book, sure. as you know, and or endnotes, technically. And, and one of them I was just looking at, and it, it was about a couple, it was very, it was one of the least consequential ones. And it was about how a couple of his supporters had committed suicide, big businessmen. And then I remembered that Kermit, his son, had committed suicide. And thinking of Kermit made me think that TR had threatened to commit suicide at the Amazon because he was very sick. And he said to Kermit, you know, uh, you, you know, uh, you go on without me and, and, and get to safety and I will take this morphine. And he carried morphine with him his whole life on these expeditions to kill himself if things got tough. Now, morphine 
triggered another thought in my brain. And this was all after the book was essentially written. That's why it's the epilogue. Yes. Okay. That's exact. That because it, I was going to hand the thing in in two or three weeks. I was still, you know, making one last pass. And all of this stuff comes to me like, whoa, okay. And the, one of the facts, one of the interesting things is that it all came together so fast. Once you started yeah, yeah. thinking about it and there was this streak of suicide in the family and suicide like diabetes or other things or alcoholism may run in the family, which does not mean that everyone in your family has diabetes sure. or kills themselves. But uh, you see that Quint or Kermit's son killed himself, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Princess Alice's daughter killed herself. Um, so it's, it's in the family. And then you see over and over again, his close friends say, you know, you, you see him so manic, but he, you know, he's manic depressive. You, he gets really, really down. He craves attention. He craves praise. And you, you can't believe how down this guy can get. So you, you see those things and morphine that he was administered morphine on the night of his death. Um, so was this uh, a situation of the morphine would be in his bloodstream and then he could take more of it from this jar, which by the way, his medical kit I checked with Sagamore Hill, uh, still exists. And wow. I said, yeah, it's, and, and I said, but all the jars are empty now in a hundred years. Yeah. I yeah, mean, but, but who knows? Uh, so did he in fact take more to get it over with? Because at this point he's been in the hospital, Roosevelt hospital on the West side of Manhattan, uh, for about two and a half months of the last year of his life. He goes, in for the last time armistice day comes out on christmas eve and we all know that older people often well i mean die of whatever causes after christmas okay and the fam the house has emptied out he can when he leaves the hospital they say you may have, may have to spend the rest of your life in a wheelchair he's blind in one eye he's deaf in one ear he has tremendous excruciating pain throughout his body he cannot, he's, he's ducking out of public appearances and he cannot even sign his own name to a dictated letter. He is in that much of pain. So the question is, does, do, with means, motive, and opportunity, does he do this? If he does it, it informs you of the price he had to pay for his glory. And I conclude the book by saying, if he does not, well, if he resists all of these factors and just dies of natural causes, well, then, then that is his greatest last triumph. Hey, guys, I want to talk to you about BetDSI.com. They've been in business for over 20 years, paying winners, and they're top rated on sportsbook review sites with an easy-to-use mobile playing interface. You play, you win, you get paid. BetDSI is a great mobile app. You can use it anywhere, and they offer live in-game wagering. You can make plays throughout the entire games and events. They've got odds in everything, sports, politics, anything you want. You can use it, BetDSI.com, if you want to have a little extra excitement in the games you're watching, even if you don't like sports. NFL season starting. Bet on that. Major League Baseball, they've got that too. Here's the thing. If you go to BetDSI.com and use promo code WELCOME100, you get a 200% bonus on your initial deposit. Free money. So that's BetDSI.com, promo code WELCOME100. Yeah, there, there's also another anecdote. This is like one of the most famous stories about Teddy Roosevelt, and it's, it's almost like George Washington chopping on the cherry tree. It's almost hard to believe it's true. Well, obviously Washington never did that. But he shot and he finishes a speech. Yes, I mean, that, that's just, how, that, tell, tell me that story. Well, in, in 1912, he's, he's in Milwaukee. He's campaigning as a progressive, uh, comes out of his hotel on his way to an auditorium to, to address a monster rally. And he's on the sidewalk and this crazy New York bartender, okay, named John Schrank, um, who is obsessed about third terms and McKinley. And, you know, he's just, he's really uh, just a, a crazy person. Uh, shoots Roosevelt. He's been trailing him for quite a while and gets up to him, shoots him. Uh, TR 
says, take me to the, to the rally. I'm going to do this speech. Because he had been a soldier in the Spanish-American War, someone had told him at that point, uh, if you're not coughing up blood, if you're shot in the chest and you're not coughing up blood, uh, you're, you're not going to die. You're okay, which is like, I don't know how sound that theory is. <laughs> right. I mean, I wouldn't want to test it. Right. But he tests it and he goes and he speaks for 80 minutes. 80 minutes and then finally they because there's blood all over his shirt and everything and the crowd is a is a gas but you know this adds to the tr legend and people think he can be elected president in 1920 even though he's so sick okay and uh i think the reason they don't see often people won't see what they 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 you know they don't want to see you know and they don't see how sick this guy is uh, because he's so indestructible, right? You shoot him, and he keeps talking for eighty minutes. Right. You 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 make him horrendously sick in the Amazon, and he he comes out again, and almost runs for president in nineteen sixteen. So you know this, you know he's not gonna die. I no, mean, he's gonna be president again. Th there's also this insane, like another insane story is that they went to I think it was Florida. I don't remember where it was. And they're spear fishing manta rays. That is incredible. And, and they're the size of a car. Manta rays are gigantic. Yes. And they're yes. just pulling them out of the water. And he's, he, uh, he gets an invitation from a guy named Cole or Coles, a um, Virginian who is the foremost marine hunter in the world and bears a really scary resemblance to William Howard Taft. How anyone who looks like William Howard Taft can be the foremost marine hunter in the world, well, I do not understand this. He's got this. the physique of a whale. And the whales well, are the alpha yeah, predators. but I mean, like he's orca. got, it's not like he's like, you know, has a submachine gun right, right. mounted on the, you know, he's got harpoons. This is TR as Captain Ahab, all right? And he's never, he's never done this before. He's pushing 58, 59 at this point. He is, you know, starting to slide. He's seriously overweight. He goes out in some rowboat in Long Island Sound to practice throwing harpoons a few times. And he comes down to Florida and I think gets the second biggest manta ray recorded ever. And the re I, I reprinted Cole's entire account of this, which ran in the old New York Sun, which is remarkable because TR is throwing harpoons and the water is filled with blood and, and the manta ray is, is, you know, is towing the boat for I don't know how long. It's, it's incredible. This is an incredible guy. Yeah. Love him, hate him, admire him. This is, this is the stuff of legend. I mean, that which is overworked, but yeah. not with him. I, I Googled, like, because uh, they called him devilfish at the time, even yes. though manta rays are completely yeah. harmless and they're pla they eat plankton and, and they, they look like they have horns, but those are kind of the filter for their mouths. Uh, I looked at like a harpooning devilfish. All the references were to TR. So I, this wasn't a common thing even back then. No. <laughs> <laughs> and then he said, oh, oh, uh, when he was in the hospital, the American magazine, which I think was run by Hearst, printed an article that said he had become diseased mentally uh, from, from the Amazon, okay? And he's like thinking, well, I'll sue them. And he's telling the doctor, he's like, no, no, I won't sue them. Well, be more, they'll, people think I'm so happy. And what I'm just going to go is I'm going to go down and hunt more manta rays. <laughs> okay. I'll go with Art. Well, then he was going to go with Archie at first. Archie was shot to hell in the war. Yeah. You know, this is seriously not seeing what the status of everything is. And then, then he accepted, uh, I think he realizes that Archie is, you know, barely functioning in one arm not going to be any good so oh ted will do this yeah. but still it's like i'm going to do this i'm going to get more of these and uh, there'll be a picture of me and everyone will realize i'm i'm swell yeah i'm, I'm not crazy i'm just killing manta rays for that's reason. right yeah <laughs> well i killed half of the african uh, veldt you yeah. know <laughs> so that's i didn't realize when i was a kid if you go to the, the museum of natural history in new york which everyone should it's amazing yeah those aren't like paper mache those are taxidermy uh, skins that Teddy Roosevelt brought back. Yeah, he and uh, or and uh, at a lot of other museums, yeah. he killed so many specimens uh, in Africa that that the that museum, which is a block long, couldn't take them all, wow. and they were sent uh, all over the country, I believe. Yeah, and there's that big statue of him out in front. That's one reason why it's there. I think his family put up some of the money originally. Okay, 
uh, but also yes. Yeah. Do you th so? Can you explain why Teddy Roosevelt is on Mount Rushmore then? Because yes, it doesn't sound like he's that. I mean, there's other presidents who are certainly FDR is a bigger deal objectively. In well, many it's ways. built before FDR. Okay, so but it's 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 a it's a clear case of it's not what you know, it's who you know. Okay, and his big pal was Guts and Borglum, the the sculpture of that, who also uh, did the Stone Mountain Memorial in Georgia for the Confederacy, you know, Stonewall Jackson yep. and all that. And later in the 1920s, I don't know if I footnote this or not, because you can only, you, even I have my limits. <laughs> Borglum becomes one of the big poobahs in the Ku Klux Klan. Again, whether the, what, you know, progressivism and, and Borglum is an official of the Progressive Party in Connecticut and a really big fan of Roosevelt. Although occasionally he'll get ticked off at him because he wanted TR to get a step aside in 1916 and back General Leonard Wood uh, for the presidency, and he, he doesn't. But Borglum loves Roosevelt. And when Roosevelt dies, his first reaction, Borglum's first reaction, is to carve a giant equestrian Roosevelt on the uh, Palisades in New Jersey. So you'd be you know, like looking up maybe from the George Washington Bridge yeah. and see TR every day. So, in, so, um, uh, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's one of the reasons. And also it's, again, it's timing when TR dies, he be a lot of the questioning of him is, is forgotten. And he's this amazing national hero, which lasts probably for throughout the twenties until Henry Pringle does a fairly critical biography. The, Everything is adulatory for quite a while. It's amazing how many bridges he burned. So, you know, when you think of these big, like, you know, very famously you had Lincoln with his cabinet of rivals, right? There are people who were, you know, originally opposed, opposed to him, but then they fell, you know, in, into place. You know, FD, uh, FDR during World War II had Frank Knox and, and his running. And Stimson. And Stimson, right, in the cabinet. It's like, okay, we're going to be bipartisan about this. Right. But with Teddy Even before the war, he brings Republicans yeah. in. He brings Ickes in who was an old TR guy, and Henry Wallace, whose father was in Harding and Coolidge's cabinet. Yeah, but Henry Wallace was hardly some right-winger. Well, I no, mean, but he was an enrolled Stalinist. Republican. Yeah. 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 Um, but Teddy Roosevelt had no... This What was amazing about this is what a politician, it turns out, he was in the sense that he had no problem not only burning bridges, but just turning his back on, on his biggest fans in support, always looking out for number one. And the story you told of the 1916 Progressive Party nomination is mortifying. It is. Um, we think of, I think it's more famous that Woodrow Wilson turns his back on his old pals, either at Princeton University or... Um, you know, rising to the president, see but, but, with hold on, George let, Harvey. Let me, I, but I disagree because Wilson is universally regarded as a jerk. Yeah, yeah. And Teddy Roosevelt is regarded as like right. a man's man. So you would think he'd have some sense of loyalty and integrity, and that's not the case many times. He's mm. a snake. Yeah. Uh, Tia, uh, Taft after that convention says, you know, he's regarded as as someone who plays fair and is a good. You know, he's not a good loser at all. He is a squealer, says Taft. Uh, with some satisfaction. But what happens is that in 1916, TR has a very, has, has a great problem in trying to get back into the Republican Party and to reunite the Progressive Party and the Republican Party. And it's, it, he, he does not have a clear idea of how to do this. The way, the most logical way to do it is to put a gun to the Republican Party's head and say, well, well, I'll run again no matter what, and I'll, I'll split the vote and give it to Wilson again. But he's afraid to do that. And I think he's afraid to do that because by this time, he's become obsessed with Woodrow Wilson. And right. he knows he doesn't want to take the risk of reelecting Wilson because he, he hates him so much. So instead of allowing the progressives who are having a convention in Chicago at the same time as the Republicans to nominate him and put that gun to the Republicans head. He draws back and allows the Republicans to nominate first. The progressives then nominate him. And then he goes, well, I don't know. 
I got to see what the Republican nominee stands for and all this. He all the time he's been attacking pussyfooters. You know, <laughs> another archaic word. These guys are pussyfooters. I want to know where Charles Evans Hughes stands on anything. And it's like, and and he won't say where he stands on. And he's giving off all sorts of different messages. Yeah. Uh, his his aide, his secretary McGrath says Tr is a can is, is a candidate. And then it's like, oh, he's not a candidate. And he's telling his son privately. And we have the transcripts. We have the actual transcripts of his te telephone conversations from Oyster Bay, Sagamore Hill oh, to wow. Chicago. Yes. Uh, so it's we, we know exactly what he said. And he says, oh, there was no way I was ever going to be a candidate. So he's been toying with these progressives the whole time oh, wait, for a year. To point out these are. This wasn't. They this, love him. This was a. It wasn't even the Progressive Party. It was the Teddy Roosevelt Party. They were only in that party really because they loved him so much. Yes. It was a party based on one man and his personality, and he, these are the people he's just like thanks but no thanks with no notice. And he's also he's also deriding them as crazy people and loons and irresponsible. He says, "We have the Republicans have all the crooks and we have all the cranks." Yeah. So. It's like, you know, he he's just throws them away like a used tissue. And he did the same thing in 1898 when he was going to run for governor. And there was a group of, there was an, an independent party, you know, New York State and all these third parties yeah, yeah. back then. And he throws them over, doesn't take their endorsement when Boss Platt uh, and the Republicans uh, back him and make them his uh, candidate. Michael Malice here. I want to talk to you guys about Heshi socks. I love these socks. I've been talking about them every week. Why? Because I've been wearing them every week. H-E-S-H-I-S-O-C-K-S.com. Heshi socks. Regular socks are thin and they hurt your feet when you have nice shoes, right? No, no. They're like 30 bucks a sock. These are not expensive. They cut out the middleman, HeshiSocks.com does. They're cushioned in the footbed. They heal in the toe. So it's like we're wearing pillows. They're so fun to sleep in. And I sleep in them every night. They've got arch support in the foot so they stay secure like an athletic sock. And they're made with high-end Pima cotton. So it's super soft and highly breathable if your feet sweat. And it's also antimicrobial so that the shoes don't smell or your feet don't smell. So they got a bunch of different styles. You can wear them out. You can wear them to work. You can wear them at home, dress shoes sneakers doesn't matter if you go to heshisocks.com h-e-s-h-i socks.com and use code welcome 30 you get 30 percent off 30 percent off so i genuinely love these socks and wear them heshisocks.com you also uh had some exciting news which is rare for a historian but your book 1920 was optioned for what a miniseries yeah yeah now I mean, an option doesn't mean it's gonna happen of course Oh, uh, but you know, you don't win the lottery unless you have a ticket. And this but, is a pretty good sized ticket. Yeah. Um, and it's by uh, Charlie Mathau, who was Walter Mathau's son. Uh, he contacted us a few years ago, actually, and then nothing came of it. And then he, I picked up the phone one day and you know how you ignore the calls now on your cell phone? Yeah, that, like, I don't know this. It's like something told me, answer this call. Dave, is this Charlie Mathau? It's like, is the property still available? Why, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so some negotiations ensued, and uh, we're we're moving forward with, with that, or he's moving forward with it. It's up, all up to him now. And a six-part series on 1920, which to be launched wherever uh, in anticipation of the 2020 election, which works for me i guess yeah but that's exciting it is exciting i mean i'm sure as a historian you don't often write book you don't write books expecting there to be made into something else <sighs> not that one i mean i have had rothstein option three times okay including a, a major tv network and a really major motion star and 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 his production company okay and nothing nothing came of those so i've been to the dance before right right and so uh it's like well, i don't know if this will happen but you know if it does happen that'll be uh terrific and we have the um anniversary coming up for 2020 so we'll hopefully get a, get some sales out of that uh anyway but if the book launches uh great one of the things i love when i it, as an author, uh, it really comes through when you're when I read your books, you're really having fun with this. Like it really comes through that there's this this kind of like whimsy to it that you're just like you find you found it the absurdity and the humor 
in in these personalities i mean is that not the case when you write ah uh, i think there are a lot of person uh, historians who would come across the stuff i come across first off i i i go through the old newspapers a lot and they were so well written so i love to i love to quote the newspaper accounts like you know Ida tarbell complaining about TR throwing the progressives over. Just wonderfully written stuff. Yeah, because they knew how to be bitchy and yet like refined at the same yeah, time. So the, mean, the, way, the way they write it is so scathing but so polite. It's or, hilarious. Or Haywood Brune, yeah. uh, who was uh, a really radical guy. He was kicked out of the Socialist Party later for appearing at a Communist Party platform in 1930. Um, but he says, oh, there's this moment where uh, a, a speaker is at the progressive convention in 1916 and uh, says are you going to get down on your knees to the Re republican party and he says at the republican convention this would be a mere rhetorical question <laughs> <laughs> but yeah you know it, just great stuff um, but yes, I look for that stuff. And I think another convention or a historian would be saying, oh, well, let's look at the bigger picture here. Let's not talk about these things. Let's not talk about these things which are interesting and fun and which give life and are, and are fun. And early on, I used to like agonize over whether I would put this stuff in, you know, in earlier books. And then I go. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. that because that's what makes it feel like you're watching a movie. Because you have all these one liners. If I find it interesting, right. maybe my readers would. It, and I, I like to I like to share good things with people. Yeah, hey, you know that restaurant? Order that. That's really good. It's just very rare. Why I love your books to read a history uh, again with men who these are presidents. They're titans of the world, and yet you're laughing because in some ways they're like Keystone cops, and they're, they're, their flaws are so. As big as their egos and as their accomplishments. Right. I mean, you talk about what Woodrow Wilson's reaction was when FDR died. When, sorry, when Teddy Roosevelt died. Yeah, yeah. I, he he gets the uh, news in the train station in Italy. He's on his way to Paris, and he looks at it, and it's like this big smile on his face. And <laughs> and more to the point, he he, he he's given a, a draft of a statement by someone to to send to Mrs. Uh, Roosevelt. And he's scratch. I'm like deeply, deeply mourning. Uh, no, deeply is out. Then mourning. I'm shocked. I'm shocked by his death. And he doesn't mention anything about TR's fight for preparedness or for the war. It's about how I think it's about how he wanted like the redistribution of income yeah. or something like that. It's it, it was it was worded really radical for Wilson even. Yeah, it, it's just very fun. It's funny to see, and it, it, even the thing is, they agreed on many many issues. They're both yeah. mad at the left, but their personalities were so. I mean, Wilson is like ice, like an ice maiden, yes. and Teddy Roosevelt is like a, a giant frat boy. Well, they, did, they disagree on the preparedness issue. Right. That 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 would have split them, even if they were were close. And that was that. Roosevelt's pet issue, as and, you made and clear. the trust busting too, because they see it as a different way. Tr is you know after about 1904 he is very allied with the house of morgan his right. big money man is a guy named george w perkins who i think gives like two hundred fifty three thousand dollars in in 1912 that's big money yeah yeah and keeps on pouring money into the party and of course tr has secured you know, the great trust buster in 1904 gets 70% of his campaign contributions from the corporations. Yeah. After his secretary of commerce and labor, because it was one department then, which is a new department, and they had a bureau of corporations, which knew all the dirt on the corporations. And he takes that guy who knew all the dirt on the corporations to get hello corporations would you like to sign here and make a donation to the republican national committee yes we would yes we would and that tr denies this happens but it comes out in the 1912 election yeah there's a, there's that book by crowley he talks about or crowley how it's pronounced the, a lot of the progressives were for the trusts 
because the idea was if you have one big corporation running an industry yeah. and then you the government's kind of guiding it, I mean, this is the pre-fascist model, then that works out for everyone because it's efficient and it's not wasteful There's and you're not know, comp that competition. So it's really kind of weird to watch that in retrospect because we're taught so much that they're all anti-monopoly. No, no, no. A lot of them no. are very pro-enforcing monopolies. Yeah, if the good monopolies can yeah. stay. The good trust can stay is, is TR's... Uh, one, one of the things which divides TR and Taft is that Taft has brought an antitrust suit against U.S. Steel. And TR regards this as a slap at the face at, at, at his policies of letting them go and allowing them to uh, acquire another steel company in, in like 1907. So, yes. In 1912, now the radical, the so-called radical uh, progressives, big P progressives, are ticked off at TR and at George W. Perkins because the 1912 progressive platform is gutted of antitrust and anti-monopoly uh, uh, wording. And it says basically that these are, you know, these are a good thing in modern society. There, there is what's, there's something really funny in here, which is that Teddy Roosevelt's... Um... Uh, one the woman who edited his Metropolitan Magazine article. So no, no, McKinley was Sonia Levin. Yeah, M McKinley was shot by an anarchist. Yeah, and Roosevelt later said like anarchists can't be citizens, and he you know he went out. Against that was her. one of the big uh, yeah around 1903. You see a lot of uh, uh, there's a book called Aliens and Dissenters uh, about the uh, anti radical moves uh, of or from the beginning part of the century. And it starts with anti-anarchist laws around 1903, and TR is making all these big statements. But he ends up deporting almost nobody because you know I, I, there's just no no grounds really. But it's also funny that his editor was an anarchist, and he called her Little Miss Anarchist. <laughs> That's what he says. I think he might have been teasing her. Okay, but yes, it it, it, it and she was uh, you know a Russian born. She became a screenwriter right. later on. It's interesting. Uh, a, I digress, as I often do in these books, but or in person. Uh, she becomes a screenwriter in Hollywood in the 20s, and so many women are prominent in screenwriting in silent films, and oh. that stops with talkies. Huh. It, it, I mean, not exactly, not entirely. Francis Marion still writes, you know, wins an Oscar after that, but after that, it really drops off. But in the 20s, like Anita Luz, L O O S, is. is working for D.W. Griffith when she's 12 years old. She finally shows up and it's like, oh, you're a kid. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like, okay. What I found interesting was towards the end of their lives, Taft and Ro Teddy Roosevelt somewhat reconciled. Yes. And it, it's such a contrast to what I'm thinking of with uh, Alexander Hamilton's widow. And it was either Madison or Monroe, I forget which one, the last one surviving. And he goes to visit her and he had leaked the stuff about the about Hamilton's affair to the press. Oh. And he goes to visit her and she doesn't come downstairs and she's like, have you come to apologize? And he's like, let's bury the hatchet. She's like, have you come to apologize? He's like, no. And he's, she's like, get out of my house. <laughs> right. Uh, so there is this kind of, so I thought that was kind of a sweet moment that there is this, even though I think Taft still was like, I don't trust him as far as I can throw him. There is a little bit of reconciliation there, especially yeah. against the horrors of Wilson. Taft is wary and I think TR takes Taft's support a little too much for granted at that right. point. But there is the moment which, uh, which other people have written about, and I wrote about in 1920, where Taft gets the news of Roosevelt's death and you know comes into New York and goes to the church where the funeral is held and is told to sit in closer like by one by Archie Archie Roosevelt yeah. says come sit closer and then TR or, or Taft goes to the grave and is just bawling and is maybe maybe the most distraught person of all at the at the grave site you know because they had been such friends and and Taft is reduced to tears by this by the split in 1912 I mean it's it's a personal thing you know, is the civil wars are always the hardest and the sure. meanest, but that that's because you know they were so very close at one time. Yeah, I mean this. I mean he was in the White House because of Teddy Roosevelt. Yeah, yeah. And for him to come back and be like, "Now nah, I want to take it back," it's like I'm, I'm the president. What do you want me to do? I'm the president. <laughs> right, you know, he, I and and Taft, I I think at one point was willing to give it up 
but he was just, you know, not under these circumstances. Right. That's you're not going to, you know, with his statement, you know, even a even a, a, a rat in the corner will fight. Yeah, that's the other thing about which is a hell of a statement for a president. Sure, but it also speaks to t how ham-fisted Teddy Roosevelt was because if he had played his cards right, he could have gotten Taft to do you know kind of step aside for him, but he had to basically force him or or just waited until yeah. 1916. The thing is, this is at that point, you know, the the country was evenly divided in the 19th century. You take a look at all those elections and the House of Representatives and all that. But with McKinley, the the country becomes a Republican country. Yeah, there's a big edge, and it, you, the, the Republicans have to do something really spectacular, like split into a progressive party, yeah. or have a Great Depression for the for the Democrats to win. And when Wilson wins in 1912, it's with, with 41 percent of the vote. That's worse than Bryan got in yeah. any of his three races. And he doesn't get a majority in running on a platform of peace and prosperity. He doesn't get a majority of the vote. Right. So, the you know, if Roosevelt runs in 1916, he probably can come back. But he's under a lot of pressure from, again, those those progressives, those people who are going to going to back him in 1912. And it's like, OK, and he can't wait. He can't wait. One of the other things that's interesting is nowadays we think, oh, the, the Supreme Court's always nonpartisan and, you know, so on and so forth. And they're kind of just there to force the law. In 1916, uh, Charles Evan Hughes left, who was formerly governor of New York, left the Supreme Court to run for president and almost won. Almost wins uh, is fairly easy choice for the Republicans uh, because he's been out of that whole uh, Republican, Taft, Roosevelt, Civil War. He's been on the bench, so he hasn't been involved. TR does not like him. Well, that's uh, an understatement. He, he really loathes him. But again, he'll, you know, once he's the nominee, once he uses the nominee, oh, he's great. He'll make a fine president, yeah. blah, blah, blah. And then, ah, he was a bum. Right. <laughs> you know? So, uh, but in, in 1904, sort of the same thing happens when the Democrats nominate the a justice of the New York State Supreme Court to run for against Theodore Roosevelt Alton B. Parker. And then in another double cross, this is this is really the worst double cross. TR in nineteen sixteen has promised his support to or is that nineteen eighteen? Whatever. <laughs> nineteen sixteen to Judge Samuel Seabury a name which should be familiar to New Yorkers because he's the guy who nails Jimmy Walker on corruption charges in the early 1930s. The, the mayor of New York. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Uh, Tammany Hall. Yeah. Seabury had just been elected as a progressive, okay, and a Democrat to the highest court in New York State. He gets off of a 14-year term to run for governor against a guy that Roosevelt doesn't like, a Republican, and he's been promised Roosevelt's support. And then he picks up the paper or he gets a call one day, Roosevelt has support, has endorsed your support, your opponent. And Seabury rushes to Sagamore Hill and says, what have you done? Here's, the, here's your letter to me saying, I want you for this office, this office or governor. Yeah. What's the deal with that? You, your word can't be trusted and tr is like so yeah i mean really really bad yeah it, it's it's just it, but that's the other thing that's interesting is back then uh, you know obviously famously like when when truman left the white house he wasn't loaded he didn't you know until he wrote his memoirs i think he started right. to make some money there was no well there's no pension, pension for them yeah so there also wasn't much of a precedent of like what does a president do after he's out of office especially when he was so young i mean teddy Roosevelt was extremely 50 years old yeah to be 50 and to be ex-president i F mean fdr is 51 when he gets into the white house yeah so isn't it true this is something that i was wondered wasn't FDR only the vice presidential nominee in 1920 for the Democrats because they were trying to cash in on the Roosevelt name? I think that was part of it. Because um, he was assistant secretary of the Navy. This is hardly some yeah. kind of prominent position. So he has the Roosevelt name. He is, they've nominated, Democrats have nominated James M. Cox, who is not part of the Wilson administration. So they don't want to say, oh, we're turning our back totally on the Wilson administration. We'll get somebody in. But somebody who has, you know, not been too controversial. 
or on domestic matters or anything like that. And also, they have won a war. So somebody who's had a part in winning the war. Right. And um, it's also a, a sort of sop to the New York Democrats. It's, it's, you know, it's a big state. You want to help carry New York. If you want to have a chance, you've got to carry New York. And, and the Tammany people are sort of like with the first Roosevelt being nominated for vice president, oh, nominate him for that and we'll get him out of New York. Okay. So a lot of reasons, there's always a lot of reasons to do stuff in politics. Yeah. It's also funny how psychologically we think, uh, you know, World War One was such a big dividing, uh, like the world before World War One, the world after World War One is so profoundly changing, you know, Europe and, and the States. Uh, but, you know, I, I kind of had a, uh, um, just kind of this double take because there's drama between Teddy Roosevelt and Warren Harding, who are in in one sense yes. men of completely different eras, but they're not. They're from the same era, you know, in terms of chronologically. Yeah, that was one of the surprises of the book. How these guys who had been at each other's throats in 1912, Harding ran this little newspaper in Marion, Ohio, and uh, his editorial comments are just scathing scathing about uh, Roosevelt. He's like the Aaron Burr of the 20th yeah. century. Um, you know, he can't be trusted, blah, 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 blah. And then they get together after 1916 and are meeting and corresponding. And at one point, TR hints to Harry Dougherty, who is Harding's right-hand man, or because he's so crooked, maybe his left-hand man, um, that there will be a Roosevelt Harding ticket in 1920, which is, you know, something to think about, you know, who would die first right? because they're, you know, they're both on their last legs, really. Um, so yes, TR, it can be a very flexible guy. One of the reasons why the old guard is willing to turn to Hugh, well, well, they're, they're, they, they, I think one of the bosses says, you know, TR would honor a deal with us, but but Hughes wouldn't even make one. Right. He, he'd be above that. Right, but right. But TR would honor the deal. Um, and he does, you know, when he's in the president for a while, uh, at first, he treads very carefully with the Republican Party. He knows it's going to be a tough road to get that nomination in 1904 because, you know, accidental presidents have never pulled that off. Right, right. Uh, one of the things that you, yeah, look at uh, Andrew Johnson, for example. Johnson. Tyler, yeah. um, Millard Fillmore, you know, it doesn't, uh, Chester Arthur, TR is the first, and he's the first person who had been vice president since Van Buren right. to go into, the, into uh, the Oval Office on his own steam. I don't even think they had an Oval, Oval Office then. <laughs> One of the things that you mentioned in your introduction is when you're, isn't it, it's intimidating when you're dealing with someone who's as famous as written about as Teddy Roosevelt. Like, aren't you, aren't you worried that you're going to, you're going to miss something and it's almost inevitable. You're going to miss something. I mean, well, you are going to, miss yeah, something. it's, it's inevitable. Well, that's, that is, if you write about something which is so obscure that you are the greatest expert on it by far, well, who's going to question you. Right. But with, with something like this, it's like, you know, everybody's an expert, you know, and who do they uh, secure to do the review and, uh, you know, and, and say, well, he should have said this or emphasize this or this is, you know, but you know, it is, it is what it is. And I, I've tried to play it as, as fair as I can. I mean, it sounds very negative about TR, but there's this, and, and a lot of biographers have said, this is the least admirable part of his career. Oh Yeah. I mean, because this is the giant in decline. And and also, uh, you know, the the whole hyphenated American thing. Oh, yeah. Where he's, he's just so super American. You know, he's right. He's right on the preparedness issue. The country is, is not prepared when we finally get into war. So if you're going to try to have a negotiating posture with Germany, even if you don't get into war, you have to have something to make the Germans sit up and listen. Yeah, 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 right. Peace and and, strength, I, and yeah. one of the reasons why the Germans are willing to to have resume unrestricted war or submarine warfare in 1917 and make these advance these stupid advances to Mexico is because they think, well, we can knock the Allies out of the war before the Americans ever get around to doing anything. Right. We don't take any American casualties on the ground for a year 
until uh, after declaring war. Right. Um, Quentin Roosevelt, TR's son, is is in France eleven months uh, before he seriously gets into aerial combat on the Western Front. One of the things that you have is you have a cop uh, a replica of Teddy Roosevelt's death mask. Yes, that's pretty morbid. It is. <laughs> They uh, they brought someone in. Uh, he was going to be sculpted, uh, and and they were working on it before he died. And I think it's it's interesting to see. He he looks a bit different than I, I think we visualize. He looks he looks heavier, and and he got a haircut that day, and it looks like a bad haircut actually. <laughs> <laughs> Which I guess might be one of the you know it's like why is he getting this haircut on the day he dies if right. he was gonna. I think his personality could have switched very, very quickly, or his 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 mood of, uh, of 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 where his life was going or not going at that point. Last time we talked, you mentioned that I don't know if I can reveal this. I, should, I think I can. That you were working on a book about the 1904 election called Landslide. I don't know if I'm going to do that. Or okay. Not. You know, uh, I I might do that. I mean, I, uh, one of the problems I face is is. You drill so many dry holes in this business. You, okay. you f this book, TR's Last War, at one point was going to be like a contrast between TR and Wilson. But, um, you know, John Milton Cooper had done that. And I think, you know, years ago, my mentor in publishing said, don't do dual, dual biographies. Okay. It, it weakens your appeal. Huh. And I, I think that's true. Okay. okay. For example, 1932, I thought there would be these two big circles in terms of sales. Right. Okay. There would be this circle of FDR and there would be this circle of, of Hitler. Right. Because it was about U.S. and Germany. And I would, I would be able to draw from these two circles. And I think I was able to draw from where the circles intersected. Oh. In sales. Okay. Got it. Did I just make a double alt-right sign? No, no, you're fine. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I just don't, you know, you can't be too careful. <laughs> <laughs> Did you, oh, I, 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 we were all fangirling. I, my next book's about the new right. Yeah. I just got the copy of that. One of the things that was very funny, we were talking right before the show. Uh, this will be the last question. Um, you got triggered and you went on this little mini rant, and I said, save it for the air, about bad historians. Oh yeah, yeah. So like, I, I won't I won't name what the no what you don't the, have to name what names. the book is, but I I was asked to look at a, a manuscript, and it was, <laughs> you know, somebody was looking at a train on his first voyage to when the, when he was like a kid, and what he was thinking as he's looking out the train past some town, it's like you don't know this, right? There's no way you're gonna don't don't play with the readers like this don't try to make it into a novel right if you're writing history stick with the facts you know and don't change things to the meaning of words to fit it into some political narrative of what's going on today okay in the, in this case it was a question of the of the meaning of the words immigrants right which what you were talking what the guy was talking about was like migrants or something and no, don't do this because I'm, I'm just, I, I said to myself, if he, if this guy does this one more time, <laughs> I'm done. And then he did it on the next page. It's like, sorry, I'm not, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to recommend this. Uh, there is this great quote by, uh, the theater. I'm very much afraid of reading bad writing, huh. let alone bad history. It's sort of like there's a, there's a scene in a movie called bang the drum slowly about baseball about how losing is like a disease, as contagious as syphilis. <laughs> I think bad writing is like a disease. I I'm afraid to have it seep into, you know. Oh, I, I, that's very interesting. So I have the opposite approach. I encourage people who are starting out as authors yeah. to read bad writing. Really? Identify the mistakes. Oh. And once you consciously identify those mistakes, you'll always avoid them. Okay. So there's certain- It's easier to see mistakes in other people. Well, sure, but once, like a lot of times, you know, like in a resume, if if you, if you tell someone don't do these five things, you know, they'll at least be competent, you know, because there's some big mistakes that, like you just said, like don't 
give ascribe thoughts to a person you never even met. Right. I mean, that's just should be one on one kind of stuff. Right. Unless somebody has said they were thinking sure, that in their memoirs. And then you could footnote that, right. But yeah. that's very different from, you know, kind of making them into like a like you said, like a historical novel, like, oh, I know what he's thinking here and his heart was beating. It's like no, no, right. no let's just his tie was red and yeah, you know stick to the facts. His socks were drooping. So no. what what are you working on now? Because I know you you're you're not gonna take a rest. I'm working on publicizing this. No, no, but I mean, are you working on a... a no, what, I'm not working on a new book right now. What are you thinking about, though? What is there anything that strikes you Again, a couple of TR things. You know, maybe that 1904 book, or maybe another aspect of TR, or maybe a, a, a biography of, of, like, a 1920s figure. I would love to read you writing about Woodrow Wilson, who I think is by far the worst president, and also probably the worst person to ever be like just a really horrible human being so to hear all the nastiness both from him and from those around him i think colonel house and all these people i mean just he just you, he's a vicious person you got the, you, you, there's enough material for me to work with yeah <laughs> i thought about actually i did pitch this to someone once about doing uh you know ghosting a book with someone and and i was said i was told yeah and then nothing happened but yeah, I mean, I, I think I could do it. Um, and I think, uh, I think pull it off. Last question then. Uh, after doing all this work and, and basically writing about the last chapter of Teddy Roosevelt's life, do you have a greater appreciation of him or a, a smaller? He's, I think maybe a greater understanding. Okay, yeah. He's very complex He's in this book. He's very complex. And he's he's really floundering. Yeah, that's the thing. He's he's floundering. He doesn't know what he's supposed to do. Right. Uh, he knows what he wants to do. He wants to get into that war and get killed. Yeah. Which is another part of what we we're talking about. His his death wish, and it's a death wish. It's a bloodlust, and it's a death wish. Where you know the famous anecdote, which appears to be true, where. Um, he had uh, he he's complaining to Elihu Root that you know Wilson wouldn't let me go command this regiment on the Western Front, and all I was asking for was permission to go and die. Right. And Root says, "Did you make that perfectly clear to the president?" <laughs> <laughs> but it's all, just also funny how you know in, when you read this, these figures sound contemporary the way they talk. But the the one, the one thing you just mentioned is like before World War One. There really was this idea, and it was even in like the the, you know, the Ivy Leagues, that there's nothing more admirable than for a young man to go and die in war. And now, when we think about that, it sounds, you know, there's that famous story, Rendezvous with Death, that poem. Yeah, I think he went to Harvard or Yale, you know, and he's talking about like, you know, yeah, maybe I could grow old and die, but I have a Rendezvous with Death. Is that I'm Pete Seeger's uncle? Is it? I think it is. And it's and you read this story, and they're so excited, like this is my destiny, and it's I'm going to fulfill it. Isn't that wonderful? And you're like, no, young man, that's not wonderful. It's horrible. Uh, and World War One, I, I think, taught people that that like this isn't great at all. Yeah, Gifford Pinchot, yes, his yes. brother Amos. Who, became, who was really quite isolationist in like World War II, uh, writes about how this was like a, a big rich man's upper class war, that they were just, that, that the upper class was just chomping at the bit to fight. Yeah. And, and you do find that it is in the East, the Northeast, and maybe in the South as well, but then the, the further West you go, it's really... You know, they don't want any part of this war. Yeah, I mean, and it, it carried through for, for many years. David, I highly recommend the book. Thank you so much for coming Thank in. You. I hope it's a huge success. Uh, and I will see you all next week. You are welcome. Mm. That was, oh, thank you so much. This was such a treat, too. And look, I got the sticker.